Hi, and welcome to the Active Code podcast, brought to you by Aspire Active Partnerships. I'm Paul Griffiths, and joining me each week on the pod is Luke Johnson. Aspire Active Partnerships is a community of like-minded business leaders who all believe that collaboration in the sports coaching and children's activity sector is essential for success. We've proven that working in collaboration does benefit business growth and essentially helps more children be more active more often. To combat physical inactivity, we need organisations that are performing at their very best. Organisations will only operate to high standards if they are led well. So, if we can focus on developing high quality leaders throughout an organisation, not just at the top, customers will experience higher quality services, which means heightened enjoyment levels and increased levels of physical activity. And if we do this at an early age, we know that we can build the foundations for a more active, happier and healthier life. The Active Code investigates what it really takes to be a successful leader and how organisations can combat physical inactivity. We won't be alone through this journey. We are joined by business owners and experts from our sector, as well as inspirational people from outside our industry. We'll understand the importance of physical activity to our guests, reflect on leadership experiences, and gain thought-provoking insights on how we can crack the Active Code get more children more active more often if you like what you hear please leave us a rating and subscribe wherever you get your pods our guest during this episode is a ceo at the chartered institute for the management of sport and physical activity or as many of you will know them simspa simspa is a professional development body for the uk sport and physical activity sector committed to supporting developing and enabling professionals and organizations to succeed and as a result, inspire our nation to be more active. We've recently formed an exciting partnership with Simspa, as we feel collaboration on standards, high quality, and the development of career pathways in the sector are crucial parts of the puzzle to get more children more active more often. Through introducing you to Tara and the work Simspa do, we hope to bring you, your organisation, and your workforce support, guidance, and inspiration to continue the great work you already do. As CEO at Simspa, for seven years now, we are keen to hear Tara's story and the motivations behind the great work Simspa have done and are going to be doing moving forwards. We'll be delving into the secret of Simspa's success, rapid growth, and the direction Simspa wants to take the sector and the amazing impact Simspa has had on physical activity levels. We are super excited to bring this podcast to you. Enjoy the episode. Tara, thank you for, for joining us today on the Active Code podcast. Um, it's nice to be live in person. We've not done this many times, so we're, we're at Loughborough today with Tara. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to this conversation. And let's start, as we always do, um, by sharing your background with our listeners. Uh, well, this could go on for a while. Um, well, I, I began my career in 1987, would you believe? I was um, studying my A-levels. Uh, and at the same time, I was doing a P course at an FE college. Um, and I did my bronze medallion, which was a lifeguard qualification in those days, and got a part-time job at a local leisure centre. And in those days, because um, I'm ancient, you had little brown envelopes on a Friday with cash in it. So I got quite hooked by wages on a Friday. And then I took on all the shifts available, and then they said, hey, do you want to do a swimming teacher's qualification? So I did that. And then they said, can we become a group X instructor, then a fitness instructor? And then I, I just got hooked. I, uh, I just did that full time. I um, completed my A-levels. I was supposed to go off to uni and didn't um, because I was working. I, I, I remember that first year, um, I was pretty much seven days on, you know, a day off, seven days on. It was just earning lots of money, but the variety of it was fascinating. Um, I liked teaching. I was sporty anyway. Um, so yeah, I started a leisure centre in Swindon, the Oasis, which is uh, sadly now closed, but iconic in its day. Uh, and then I had a panic. And I thought, oh, I didn't go to uni, and all my mates have gone to uni. Am I going to look like a loser when they come out? So I, I decided that whatever job they would enter into on graduation, I at least need to be at that level. So I set myself a little target. So then I became a supervisor and a duty manager in another leisure centre, a brand new build. 
Um, and, and the rest is history, really. I stayed working in leisure. I was local authority for about uh, 12 years and then about 10 years in the private sector um, as a contract area manager for a company called DC Leisure, um, working all over the country. Uh, and that's where I, uh, I learned a bit about business and culture and <coughs> running organisations, people, etc. Um, and then to cut, fast forward massively, um, I was an advisor to the board at the Royal Life Saving Society for a while, and a job came up, uh, executive director of IQL, which was the trading arm of the charity, um, so the lifeguard organisation, really, and that's you know where it all started. Um, although I did get massively into the fitness side of it, um, yeah. I took that exec director's job on uh, for, uh, I think, seven years. And then um, Simspa was going through, um, it, was, it was having a challenge in time. Um, and uh, my, we didn't have a CEO at the time and there was lots of debate about whether or not Simspa needed to exist at all. Uh, and the chair of the board gave me a call and asked me if I'd look into it, um, which resulted in a secondment, uh, which I highly recommend against. Never agree to a secondment when you're an exec director of one organisation uh, and trying to be an interim CEO of another one. Uh, it's not physically, mentally possible. But anyway, we did it for a while. And my job there was just to established whether or not the sector needed a chartered institute and whether or not it could commit to it um, what success of a, of a chartered institute would look like for stakeholders um, presented that back to the board and that the intention was that would be my secondment over um, and I would make a recommendation to the board as to the type of CEO they should be looking for um, and I was pretty convinced at the beginning that I wouldn't be applying for the job, but I got you know, quite involved in it because it was clear to me then that the sector very much wanted a chartered institute and, and it was very clear about why um, <clears throat> and how it might work. And I was pretty wed to the same principles, um, which I'm sure we'll come on to cover later about what Simpson actually does. Um, but it seemed to me like a very worthy project uh, and a very important thing for the sector to have. So, um, and one that might leave a legacy. Um, so I did, I obviously, it's pretty obvious that I did for the job when I got it, which is seven years ago now, uh, almost eight. Uh, yeah, and that's a potted history of my, um, I did, I, I came out of the sector for a bit, I think I did a year of teaching in a secondary school, and then that wasn't for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah, that's a very small part of history. That's fascinating, and we will come on to Simpson in a bit more detail later on in the pod. What impact would you say sport and physical activity has had on you, outside of your career, but on a kind of personal level? Uh, well, uh, that's where my interest was Luke really um, so when I was younger I was you know a bit like yourself a bit of a sport billy uh, did a bit of everything uh, my sport of choice in the end was hockey but you know it's athletics tennis swimming netball you know we were talking about earlier Paul with your kids uh, and then you get to an age don't you in your teens you've got to pick one really mm. if you're going to be good at one so I sort of picked hockey and I wasn't too bad at that um, so yes and, and you know, you, at the time, did I know that sport was shaping me in a certain way? Probably not at the time, but when you look back, you do realise, don't you, that playing a team sport has an impact on your personality, understanding dynamics and sharing and um, <clears throat> communicating, uh, commitment, training, etc. It's it, it they're all positive things on your personality and you, and your own ambitions and, and particularly if you end up you know as a captain of a side as well what comes with that. So yeah, I, I I would say the answer to that Luke is um, 
not just a bit of an impact, it completely shaped um, where I was going to head in life. And so, so to be able to have a career based on a passion initially is, you know, not many people can say that, I don't mm. think, in my career. And does that come from, so you're, as a child, <coughs> various sports you played and participated in. Yeah. Where did that come from? Was it, was it family kind of influence? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, very much so. My dad was pretty sporty. My my, my brother was is, uh, you know. Consequently, all the kids in the family are pretty sporty as well. Um, yeah, my dad was. Uh, I mean, he was a is a pilot, but he started in the RAF. <clears throat> so the RAF had you know fantastic sporting opportunities. Yeah. So he was a row and a rugby player, and um, and and you know very fortunate that. We had um, a mum who was, you know, the taxi driver who was prepared to pick us up, drop us off at tournaments, buy the kit and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, very fortunate in that respect. But, yeah, it, it, it was a family a family thing. Uh, I think we're a pretty competitive as a family. It's no fun on Boxing Day playing games at all, <laughs> I can tell you that. But, uh, do, do you... Um bring the hockey shin pads out of retirement at any time or keep active in different ways? Uh, I, I do, yeah. I mean, I'd love to play loop, but um, of course our best, worst kept secret as sporty people is is the injury thing. Mm. Uh, and I'm afraid that I just couldn't play again. Uh, I've had three ops on uh, my knee. <clears throat> so, uh, and I remember trying to get back into it at the level I was playing and uh, it was quite depressing actually not being able to do what I used to be able to do. I think nowadays, if I had the treatments that are available now, I think I probably would have been able to, but back then I couldn't. Um, then I tried my hand at coaching, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but I, when I discovered I needed to coach a sport that I hadn't played, um, which is an odd thing to say, but coaching hockey was too painful. I wanted to pick the stick up and run around, you know, and that was. That was tough, but I but I enjoyed coaching individuals actually and getting fit. And um, now, <coughs> Luke, my 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 latest fad this year, I have got into CrossFit. And I wasn't a fan before. I've done it all year since January, and I've got to tell you, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Okay. The thought of me going into a sort of stinky, grunty-looking gym, you know, with um, uh, weights and barbells it you know just wasn't for me at all and, uh, but I love it it's, and, the, and the results are phenomenal and super quick as well and the social element I guess as well yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah and I've got a great PT who's a symptom member Johnny Andrews um, I wouldn't dare go in that gym alone without the support of Johnny but he yeah he's very motivating and super qualified and super engaging so that's that's helped massively but yeah I don't, you know, I don't have any biceps yet, but I do feel, <laughs> I do feel better for it. What, what kind of are those benefits that you feel keeping physically active? Maybe that kind of translates into your day to day life. If you've been physically active the day before, you kind of feel better at the desk, maybe things like that. Yeah. Well, th there's there's two sides to it for me, Luke. Really, uh, busy job. Uh, uh, I, you know, I have to put some hours in. Um, it, it, I'm afraid it's it's part, it goes part and parcel with the the, the job that I have CEO, um, <clears throat> but uh, in addition to you know CrossFit, I've got three dogs, so they have to have a decent walk. The three labs, and I use that time every day to sort of depressurize a little bit, decompress a bit, um, get myself away from that desk. And I find when I I don't do it, I'm absolutely exhausted and yet don't sleep well. Okay. And yet, just taking the dogs out or going to the gym. Um, I, I You know, the mental capacity is there. Um, the physical exhaustion isn't quite... It, it's just not there. I just feel better for it and I sleep better. So, But the other, the other side of it is I'm knocking on a bit and... Uh, that's why I chose CrossFit because I um, it's not really about me being particularly athletic. It's really about well-being now for me. Getting older, um, I want to keep my strength up. Um, and I want to be able to do the things uh, I do now in sort of 20, 30 years' time. So 
for me, it's not about sport or, uh, <clears throat> as much as it is about just health. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're in the sector, so we understand the benefits. Um, it, yeah, it would be rather remiss of me to let myself, uh, let my core strength go, and then I sort of can't do anything when I knew all along that that's the whole mm. game. Yeah. And when it comes to physical activity engagement, what's the biggest challenge for us to overcome at the moment? As a sector? Yeah. Uh, profile. The, the, the way we market ourselves. Uh, it, we, we've just got it wrong you know uh, and, it, it, and it sounds so critical the sector that I adore um, but we'd, we, we'd, we're not selling the benefits um, we're selling memberships you know and th there are two things wrong with that one is um, particularly in the midst of a cost of living crisis uh, that's discretionary spend that people just don't have um, and I'm afraid there's still something rather elitist attached to it you know if you can afford a gym membership then we're only appealing to a certain demographic which I don't think is anywhere near good enough um, you know for the last well in my career um, I've been in this what 35 years which is ridiculous now I've said that out loud uh, but for 20, at least 20 of those years, we've had a market penetration rate of somewhere between t 10 and 14 percent. And I don't think that's something to be proud of. Um, if you were to stop, if we went outside now with these cameras and stopped 20 people in the street and said, hey, did you know that eating a healthy diet and doing a bit of activity is good for you? I, th I think we're going to be hard pushed find someone who goes, oh no, I didn't know that. You know, so the education piece is, is there, but if we're still selling something that looks unreachable, it's not for me, people there don't look like me, mm -hmm. it looks expensive, it looks hard, I'm not slim before I get there, I haven't got a beach body, I'm gonna be in amongst, you know, slightly beautiful people who don't seem to sweat. That's the image we portray, mm -hmm. therefore, we've got a market penetration rate of about 14% and it's going backwards, but largely due to COVID, I accept. Mm -hmm. um, but what about the other 86%? So we've got a long way to go in terms of, um, I, I don't want to call it marketing loop, communicating. Um, it, it, you don't have to join a gym. It's great, a gym, I use one. But you don't have to join a gym <laughs> to have a healthy lifestyle. You just need to be active. And there is more to life than the products we put on leaflets. Mm. Um, I, I remember a story, my dad, um, some years ago, had a sort of a bit of a diabetes scare, you know, and he was a pilot and you will have your pilot's license taken off you and grounded and it's pretty terrifying. He had pre-diabetic symptoms. Um, you know, and I remember his reaction. He's a pretty active guy. I remember, oh, I better join a gym then. I'm gonna have to go in every day, and you know, because that's what we've told people. Yeah. And actually, I said, you do so little apart from take the dog out now, that it's not gonna take much to reverse these symptoms. You know, so time how long it takes you to take the dog out, and then try and take ten seconds off that, and a week later, to then stick a rucksack on your back with a book in it and do it as quick again. It's just that it didn't or go out in the garden and get yourself so cmo guidance you know um so it it's this image thing that we've got wrong mm -hmm. um is that similar for children yeah you think as well yeah i don't know if you heard there was a debate on the radio some time ago about <clears throat> it was in the summer and it was a pretty ugly debate about um the benefits of children being active um, I think it was the Jeremy Vine show and there was nobody on there talking about uh, academic achievement, concentration levels, mental well-being um, that are all attributable to active children. None of that was mentioned. They, they interviewed people who'd been through horrific experiences in the 70s and 80s of having to go in a community changing room at a school for a PE lesson and it put them off for life. Mm -hmm. So 
I get that. So they probably haven't adopted an active lifestyle because something that happened to them. Mm-hmm. I get it. But there was no counter argument with all the evidence that we've got yeah. that says there are so many benefits to children being active, and it's not about fitness. <laughs> it's as much to do with, um, as, you, as I've said, academic achievement and mental well-being. Um, and also socialization, um, <clears throat> mental and physical stamina, um, physical literacy, all the benefits that the three of us know, we, we, we tend to talk to each other about it. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm afraid sometimes, I'm again, I'm going to sound a bit critical, um, hollow a little bit into our own echo chamber instead of actually mm-hmm. telling every parent yeah. who wouldn't want that for their kids, yeah. but do we... Do we communicate that uh, effectively? I, I say not yeah. yet. We've got some work to do, which is why this partnership that we've got with you is, uh, is extraordinary and why it's really important um, <clears throat> for us to help you get to where you want to be because I think everything you're trying to achieve is you know, spot on in that respect. Thank you. And you've been at Simpson Book for seven, is that nearly eight years now? Well, it will be nearly nine, actually, if you include my secondment, but yeah. So a while. <laughs> it's closer uh, to ten than that while. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, could, you, could you give the listeners a bit of a background about what, who Simpsburg are and, and what you do? So Simpsburg is uh, the professional body for workforce in our sector. So it, other sectors, you, you will have heard of organisation uh, like CIPD. So that's the professional body for professional development, um, HR. And then you will have heard of, you know... Um, the Royal College of GPs, so that's a chartered institute. Um, you would have heard of chartered accountants and um, and so on, you know, uh, surveyors, etc. Most professions have a professional body that's chartered. Um, we haven't uh, had that ever, and uh, so that's who we are. And the premise of our work is to ensure that everybody who works in our sector is suitably qualified to a reasonable standard and we set those standards with the sector so in practice how does that work um, we identify an occupation and with the sector we identify the knowledge skills and behaviors required to undertake that as a minimum standard we're the custodian of those standards as the professional body any training provider or training institute colleges higher education etc um, would need who says I'm going I can qualify people to do that job would need to map now to that professional standard so that's how it works in other professional in other professions and that's how it works in Simsbur. We don't deliver training um, what we do is we endorse those providers and sort of give them a kite mark if you like so that somebody entering into that um, occupation or learning or an employer, might say, okay, well, I'm going to employ Luke Johnson as this. Oh, look, he's met, he's, he holds a qualification that meets the professional standard. So that's how it works in practice. That's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, what we want to do is create um, a sector or a, a profession um, that's recognised uh, for the professionals in it, I, and by that I mean, you know, I I, uh, I feel very very strongly that our sector and the people working in it are completely overlooked. Um, so, for example, um, it's a bit like you know the profile we've got with the sort of shiny, non sweaty, beautiful people that only can only afford gyms. I think there's there's a sort of a bit of a negative image of people who work in our sector. You know, if you're a if you're a PT or a coach, you know, it's because you couldn't get a proper job. You know, I've heard that said, or I've heard people saying, or oh, because you didn't achieve very well at school. I mean, really, really grossly unfair. So I would like people to understand actually just what is required to become a PT or a coach or a duty manager or a swimming teacher. Um, <clears throat> or whatever actually in our sector you know anatomy physiology psychology diet nutrition marketing you know and so on there's there's a huge amount of learning that goes behind these uh, occupations and I would like people to recognize them 
So we've got three R's, um, really. Um, regulated is another piece, which is the endorsement side of it, so that um, people know that you are qualified, competent and safe to do what you do. Um, and rep rep reputable, you know, I want our reputation, um, that recognition to stand for something. Um, and particularly, I think we've got some work to do in terms of uh, not building our reputation, but showcasing our reputation to allied professions such as health and education. Um, so yes, pr building the profile of the profession is, is very much the central tenet of our work. Um, and also diversifying the workforce, both in terms of new occupations, but in, you know, in uh, diversity in its uh, purest sense, which is going back to the 14% market penetration, we have an equal problem, I'm afraid, on the side of the workforce, which is we're not a particularly diverse or inclusive workforce. Uh, and it's just not good enough. And uh, you'll see a central theme that runs through our strategy is to do something about that and quick. And the growth of Sims Crew has been incredible over the past couple of years. So mm -hmm. what are the key factors, would you say, that have helped drive that rapid growth? Um, two things, they work in lockstep. The first one is a wholesale recognition by the sector that everything we do relies on a person driving it. Um, so you, you, um, people who've been uh, bored silly by me speaking at conferences and seminars will have heard this before. We've got fantastic facilities and stadia and kit and tech and pitches and courts and uh, you know outstanding. Uh, lots of investment goes into infrastructure, but none of it works without a coach or a manager or an instructor or a supervisor. People are motivated by people, uh, and if we are going to educate people in the benefits of activity, I'm afraid a leaflet isn't going to do it. It's going to take a person who's qualified uh, and understands motivation <coughs> and has, um, has the time and empathy to understand just what it's going to take to get you a bit more active. So um, there's been a real wholesale um, recognition of that loop. I, it sounds odd. It sounds like that wasn't there before, but you know, I'm not so sure it was. You know, we opened facilities and we staffed it, um, and we've always had a particularly high turnover of staff at um, sort of entry level jobs. Um, and now I think lots of organisations, operators, deployers, employers, etc., saying they are actually what well, uh, pretty expensive staff, but also um, our single most important asset. So we must pay better attention um, into attracting and retaining that talent, because uh, without it we can't succeed in in our sort of overall mission as a sector to get people active. So that's. The first thing is there's been a real sort of cultural shift in appreciating people. And then second to that um, was that then drove um, some asks of Simpfer, which enabled us to form our ambitions, which then became very fundable. Because once you can articulate that and create outputs and show what success would look like in investing in people, that becomes very investable. So it's perpetual, really, Luke. We've, um, and I would put that down um, to, I mean, that sounds fairly straightforward, but it has been pretty meteoric, the growth. Um, and that is down to simply allowing the sector to have its voice. I think, in, you know, lots of organisations have tried this and I think it's very tempting for organisations to say, well, look, I'm the professional body, so this is how it's going to work and, and I, you know, this is my first rodeo, so I'll set some standards and I'll uh, let you have them. It's, it's too much ivory tower approach down. What we've done is said, OK, what do you need? We're here. So we've got this mantra internally, externally, we'll lead by listening. Um, so it feels like a collaboration with the sector. What are your 
strategic ambitions as an organisation or as a sport or as an active partnership or your um, circumstances, you know, making a difference in school. We want to do X, Y and Z, so we're going to need A, B and C skills and talents and new jobs and thinking a little bit sort of more out of the box. Um, and in doing so, it's been quite creative and imaginative, which means the standards have got better. Yeah. Consequently, we're getting better people, which means hopefully, consequently, we have more people more active. So that allowing people to have a say has made a hell of a difference for our growth. Yeah. We've, um, go back to the point you talked about there around almost like the filter um, and the perception that people have of coaches, instructors that come into our space. And we've seen recently we've, with some of our partners in our network who are sharing that kind of post-COVID um, recruitment is becoming a bit tougher, finding mm. the right people, getting the right fit. So how, how do we as a sector change that perception and, and say to people, look, come and come and join this workforce because not only is it a great sector to work in, not only does it have a great impact on other people, mm. but there is proper career progression opportunities mm. and it's not a, um, as my dad once said, when are you going to get a proper job mm. uh, type mm. career? Because that is still the perception in some way. Yeah. So how, how do we, I don't know, we've, we probably need a full day to talk about this, but what are the key things that need to happen in order to kind of shift that perception so we are attracting really good talent? Yeah, well, you've hit two of them. Um, one is about explaining, um, you know, precisely what it is a person does in this sector. So uh, we're working with Sport England on a project that it's a bit of a slow burner, but I'm hoping it will come off. Um, where we do just that. We showcase to people who might not work in our sector. I don't know if you've seen the Navy advert, and it says, uh, uh, born in Blythe, raised in the Royal Navy. And then there's like a, you get a real sense of what you might do. Yeah. We've never done that as a sector. Um, so, you know, I'd like you on a, in front of a camera, Paul, with um, PT, qualified in anatomy, physiology, um, kinesiology, nutrition, psychology, level four, blah, 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 you know, um, has chartered status yeah. as a, you know, PT, whatever it is, a practitioner in, um, and impacting on different types of people, you, you know, and showing that you might be working in a school setting, you might be working in a health setting. Um, you might be working outdoors, you might be working with the older, old, an older generation. So the breadth and scope of what we do, but also cleverly showing the impact we're having on health and well-being as opposed to, you know, being a beefcake heading to the yeah. beach, you know, yeah. going back to that point I made earlier of that image. So that's that one. Yeah. Second one, which you um, mentioned briefly, is we haven't talked about careers to anybody, ever. So what the professional standards have enabled us to do is now start creating that career map. And it's not actually a map, it's a matrix. You know, you can, if you imagine a four dimensional cube, you, you know, we, we can now map, say, you know, I start here as a swimming teacher and I would like to be, you know, CEO of Virgin Active. Well, there, there is a route and, and there are, for each job, there are a set of standards that are achieved, you know, that are accessible through training provider partners, colleges, etc. Um, we now have the infrastructure for that, you know, and it doesn't always have to be that route, you know, mm -hmm. there's um, latitude as well, you can, you know, there is so much more you can add to becoming, you know, from a coach, for example. Um, so that's the other thing, is showcasing the opportunities, and I think being brave about pay, um, you know, we've got some work to do on pay, and I think... Um, the sector needs to work out culturally um, uh, how it how it shares or the narrative around the value of its team. It's not always pay. It's more. It, there's a wider investment, but it's about that cultural piece required. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm fed up with hearing people say to me, well, none of us entered the sector for money, did we, Tara? Well, uh, what we're doing now is we've got a skills sh shortage and a recruitment crisis because we've been resting on our laurels or hiding behind that excuse for rather too long. Mm -hmm. So if I don't need, and this is I don't mean this to be disingenuous to anybody who works in a shop, by the way, but if I don't need to be technically qualified, I'm getting paid three times the amount as I would if I were a swimming teacher or a coach or a PT or a fitness instructor in a, in a leisure centre on the minimum wage, I know which route I'm going down. Yeah. So we've got to address it. Um, we're often asked what Cinch we're doing about it. Uh, my answer to that is we're not a union. Um, we can't. But what I will say also is that we don't run the payroll of these employers. These employers have to make a decision about whether or not it's worth the investment to keep that talent. Mm -hmm. And in the background, what we'll do is we'll showcase the sector and go and attract it. Um, and I'll work with you guys, with universities and colleges. You know, we can get in at source and say, this is the type of sector you'll be entering. These are the opportunities available to you. Um, you know, join here. We can connect those grads and undergrads with um, employers and deployers, you know, all, the, all that network exists. Um, but, you know, here's my answer to the pay crisis. Our job is to get people in the sector, it's not Cinch that loses them. Yeah. So if you, if you care and you mean it, then you might have to address your pay. Yeah. Our conversation with Tara was one we did not want to cut short, so decided to record longer than usual, which means you've reached the end of part one. Tara's podcast episode. We hope you've enjoyed it so far and join us next week for part two where Tara shares her wisdom on leading by listening, self-reflections and how to surround yourself by brilliance. See you next week for part two.